uh, my name is Susan Shupley. I'm an artist researcher. Um, I, my day job is working at the, in the Centre for Research Architecture, where we investigate human rights violations. Um, I am, I'm, I'm here in London, in the UK, with my dog, Uli, who you'll hear barking throughout at, at various moments. Um, and my work, broadly speaking, is really organized around something I've called the material witness. So really, really trying to understand the ways in which uh, materials harbor evidence of events and how is it that we might in some way have access to those to those histories to the information that's captured by uh, material entities whether those in my practice were originally much more media based but eventually also came to include sort of complex um, ecological systems in which there's a, a sort of technicity at work. And I suppose in some way that's maybe where uh, Nolan and I meet in relationship to the to materiality, uh, ecology, the kind of technical organization of matter and its relationships um, to certain sometimes kind of latent or oftentimes even sort of suppressed histories and how do we access some of that through kind of our engagements with materials? Yeah. Um, yeah, I really like the way you frame that, um, uh, especially around this question of how. I think how is very much um, the, what's, what's standing behind what I've been thinking through um, during this fellowship. Um, which is firstly that there are these um, kind of technical fields, these apparatuses, technical infrastructure um, dedicated to kind of ecological, uh, planetary, environmental, uh, like kind of the production of that kind of knowledge um, and the interpretation, uh, production of futures, anticipatory technologies. Um, and I think for me, the question has been, uh, on one hand, what else is um, kind of being produced through these infrastructures and how might we um, access that, you know, um, mm -hmm. which, which is both, um, which comes through a kind of uh, intimacy with the existing kind of forms of uh, encoding and decoding information in these um, ecological systems or ecological kind of uh, sensing systems, um, but also uh, trying to do a kind of um, like, a, yeah, trying to do a, like to, I don't know, maybe a detour um, from those conventions, you know, to try to move around them or below them, see kind of how else um, we might encounter the same uh, information that's coming out of these kind of sensing apparatuses. Um, yeah. Um, I mean, do you think, because in some way, yeah, the use of like sensor technologies and, you know, whether that's in relationship to smart forests, I mean, the ubiquitous use of sensors um, is one thing, but maybe we could also you know, think about the ways in which, how is that data aggregated? Who is using that data? For what means has that data been kind of collected? Because I think when artists are working with these sensors, it's not that they're uh, necessarily producing different modes of, say, data capture, but maybe, but it's oftentimes, it's like what the, um, you know, how that information or rather how that data is going to be sort of utilized so redirecting its flows so to speak i think is perhaps um oftentimes what is going on and also think and maybe tuning into something that might be kind of in excess or of the kind of of what the sort of specific sensor technology is trying to um harvest in terms of of data but um because now with a lot of DIY technologies and sensors in general, they're actually not usually that expensive, right? They're, it's something that we can all get our hands on, but I would 
I would argue that what these sensors are being kind of utilized for are probably very radically different kind of ends, and that's in some way where the distinction oftentimes lies. Um, so it's not for purposes of like surveillance or different or modes of governance, right? Management and control. Um, and yeah. that might be the way I understand what's at stake at times in your practice. Yeah, yeah I mean, it, in some ways it connects to like a really old um, question around access, but I think with um, this kind of, yeah, I mean, in some ways relatively low tech uh, at the moment, you know, um, with the ubiquity of sensors, sensors are not really a high technology. Um, but it's it's about maybe redistributing um, access to kind of um, like imaginative capacity in these tools, you know. And it's not that the tools are out of reach, but it's about thinking um, about how we use those tools or how uh, use of those tools can be kind of redistributed or redirected. Um, and yeah, I think for me, that's, there's something about um, bring this um, without necessarily uh, prescribing an end. You know, the, the, I think a lot of um, the way this technology is set up is really kind of goal oriented. Um, you know, there's a kind of sensing, looking for, or, um, yeah, kind of um, filtering for a specific kind of signal. Um, and I think I'm interested in what, what happens if you deploy these without necessarily being clear about what, you know, without being clear of what might emerge from it. Um, and that's, yeah, that's again, like a two-sided thing, because on the one hand, there's, you want to do that in a way that's, um, that, that kind of uh, you want to you want to do that in a way that keeps uh, a kind of structure. There needs to be like some kind of structure. And the structure that I've been exploring during this um, fellowship is are the structures that come out of the existing uses. Um, so like sensor arrays, uh, many of them kind of military, but also. Uh, academic um, kind of state planning. Uh, so taking those techniques or those conventional uses and then applying them elsewhere. And the conventional use, the, the protocols of conventional use become a kind of frame through which we try to think about like the data that emerges. You know? So there's, I don't know, there's something, um, and maybe, maybe it's because I, I, mean, I need to still think about this quite a lot, but I think um aiming for like this kind of radical openness um there needs to be a, a set of like kind of protocols for for entering that you know and, and that's kind of maybe what i'm still searching for and that's why um the work is also drawing so much on um existing kind of technical strategies, uh, sensing strategies, array strategies that come from uh, often like antagonistic uh, spaces. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that's interesting and because I think that um, when artists sometimes speak about sort of utilizing or redeploying um, these sort of technologies in the minor mode, if you will, um, it's, we still need to think, we, it still needs to be done with a high degree of kind of precision. I would always say it's not that it, it simply becomes this kind of like ad hoc set of kind of gestures. Um, and that's the sort of counter move to the dominant um, sort of state apparatus or the ways in which uh, the military industrial complex is wanting to deploy these kind of technologies. So. Um, yeah, I still think it's really important to understand all of the different ways in which these technologies are organized, how, um, like, you know, also things like file translation, compression, all of the ways in which a technology uh, 
has um, built-in parameters, and those parameters also determine um, constraints. In a, in some, for me, I would I always argue about would argue about the sort of what I, the sort of micro the politics of microprocessing, if you will. You know, when we think about the ways in which frequencies are sort of capped, because there's a predetermination as to what's an optimal kind of frequency within the sort of audio spectrum that's perhaps been organized around thresholds of human hearing. Um, these, like those kinds of like decisions, um, we need to be aware of them in order to then deal with these um, technologies and t techniques, I would say from a kind of politically informed perspective. So um, I always think it's good to, as, a, as an artist to still be as much as one can be fully aware of how this sort of system operates and how the protocols, you know, what are the built-in protocols, what are the uh, way, the, what kind of what, like, what engineering decisions have been made to, um, you know, to produce specific kind of like technical spec specs, because when we understand that, we also understand perhaps what's not being captured by a, a given sort of sensor, what's sort of dropping out. Um, and um, maybe the other point that comes to mind, I also think about when like ubiquitous sen sensing technologies are often organized around optimization. So you want to optimal, optimize the relationship between inputs and outputs, right? To achieve some sort of homeostatic system that's self-regulating. Um, and I think that's obviously wouldn't be what would be at stake, like optimization wouldn't be what's at stake in your practice because there is no um, a priori desired outcome. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's related to this, uh, to what you described as like the extra uh, earlier, you know, the, the optimization or this whole field of kind of post processing is about like narrowing the band um, of uncertainty, you know, um, and, and kind of clarifying the signal. Um, and maybe the project uh, for me is really about like what both is in that signal, what else is in that signal, but also what is kind of lost in that process of optimization. Um, and I mean, I, I think like if I think of the uh, the like historical arc um, of my interest or like kind of how I got here, um, it started with um, thinking about a set of um, I mean now I call them closed environment facilities, but I didn't really have this language at the time. But I was thinking about um, kind of lab spaces that like deal specifically with general ecology um, so some things that are called ecotrons but thinking of them in a, uh, as part of a lineage that includes um, botanical gardens, warden cases and these very like colonial um, infrastructure, like, colonial uh, ecological infrastructures you know and and, in, and I think in that in those spaces there is a similar kind of optimization there's a kind of selection um, criteria of what enters um, the botanical garden if you say but um, or what enters the greenhouse and what isn't there's a kind of value system um, that creates this kind of differential and what's inside is kind of legible or becomes the way to make parts of the world legible um, and yeah and, and so this I think this interest in like what's left out um, or what is included but included kind of um, not in its full capacities extends from it's very kind of colonial and I think now um, those strategies are quite legible you know we can read the politics in um 
the botanical garden and the zoo and the aquarium you can read those because uh but and i'm interested in thinking of uh, more kind of contemporary um infrastructure as potentially having a similar kind of political or being able to read those with a kind of similar political overlay um and yeah i mean that's maybe a very <laughs> kind of sprawling um idea but i think optimization and processing can be which are very like um language that comes out of a very kind of um uh, kind of electrical uh, engineering um uh, mode of making knowledge um or processing data let's say um but like similar language that can be like uh, related to the the kinds of selection criteria, the kind of selection protocols um, that were occurring uh, a few hundred years ago at the kind of beginning of a, a managed ecology uh, in the colonial sense. You know? um, so that's this kind of broad <laughs> arc that I'm trying to think through, um, but very much to think not um, only in the antagonist position, but also what is available in these places. Uh, and I think the botanical garden is a really interesting, as, and in that sense, all gardens are really interesting because of the excesses in there, you know? Um, yeah. <laughs> No, I find that completely kind of fascinating to sort of bring those realms together because normally we wouldn't think about the sort of the, the histories and legacies and the, like what's the kind of colonial imagination that sets up the botanical garden and how can we understand that from a, a more contemporary paradigm of computation, for example, or um, which, yeah, we are talking about, like, I suppose because those are, they had aspirations to be closed systems, right? Uh, and there's clear um, hierarchies in place and, you know, systems of classification, management and control in these, in these highly kind of regulated sort of botanical gardens or the zoo, etc. So I, I can really, yeah, I think in some way when when you reflect upon it yes it's actually quite obvious but it's not a it's not a kind of relationship that is we typically bring together um so i find that really kind of a really kind of interesting sort of move um on your part um, like that to make that kind of conceptual move i find really kind of like fascinating um can I ask you something, uh, which, because when I do think about like what escapes, what is in excess, I'm re sort of reminded of this notion of attunement that a lot of um, practitioners will talk, will use that word into attuning, you know, which is this kind of reorientation in some way and tapping into a sort of um, perhaps an environmental um, sort of system and uh, I wonder, um, and it's one thing, you know, to actually write that on paper. It's another to actually somehow embody that, inhabit that. And I wonder how that, uh, how does that happen in your practice? Um, or what are the things that, what are like sort of strategies you've developed to actually in some way enable that, which, which is a kind of like, in some way, um, maybe it's more about occupying an effectual realm, I don't know, um, in relationship to these materials rather than a, uh, the materials as like treating these kind of environments as sites of information extraction, so resource extraction. Um, yeah, I think that's such a great question. Um, yeah, I the the beginning of this whole for me the whole question of like um an interest in the earth um is so uh 
and overdetermined by my uh, social history as a South African. And the uh, like um, the huge distance, the contrived, historically um, deliberately produced distance between um, my experience of the world and access to like the earth as material, you know, like a history of colonial dispossession, apartheid, uh, spatial planning, all of that. Um, and I think the first kind of sense um, I got, uh, including just kind of observing people's strategies um, of making a relationship with the earth, um, was that you kind of have to get it where you can. And um, my, so attunement is always, I, I mean, it's such a great word as well. Um, and it always felt to me like it's about making oneself kind of uh, sensitive um, to what's possible in the space, you know? So, um, I mean, maybe that's a bit of a, <laughs> an unclear way to say it, but um, like my, my great example is the way in which people in South Africa who have had historically no access to land have nonetheless found a way in the kind of interstices of apartheid planning to make that relationship possible. Um, and that's not so much about attuning, um, to use that word, it's not, but it's not so much about shifting the actual conditions, but rather like taking those conditions as a, as a kind of ground in which things, more things are possible than seem apparent. And I think like to think about these um, bigger, more technical, more kind of distant systems um, as a similar kind of infrastructure. They set up a condition um, and the, a lot of these sensing infrastructures are about kind of remote access. You know, there's a kind of distance between where you are and where the kind of data is being produced. And I think one of the questions is how, what else is possible in that condition? Um, and so, like, I mean, in my pers like, you know, my personal capacity, um, it's really about, I, I just spend a lot of time, like, trying to, and I, <laughs> language is so um, sincere, uh, but I do spend a lot of time trying to connect with this stuff, you know, with, like, the, the type of information that comes out of these senses, the type of projects that are happening in these sites, um, these kind of lab sites, and trying to, in some way, attune myself to what's happening there. Um, so I, I think it's a great kind of segue into um, the infrasonic recording we've been sharing, um, because at the moment, that project really is at very much about an attunement, you know, it's just about deploying this thing, deploying this um, microphone, this kind of homemade microphone, getting the data, processing it um, with the help of some more technical people and, and then listening, you know, and I think this, this aspect of like listening um, is really like for for my project really necessary because of the interest in something kind of excessive you know? and um it's, it's a, yeah so so i guess like to me attunement really isn't so much about um optimizing the infrastructure although i mean that helps i think but much more about somehow creating um, a relationship or a set of relationships um, and that can only happen over time so it's just for me like really just 
accessing some of these outputs or some of this data or producing it if possible um, and then sitting with it and sharing it and trying to yeah I'm like, yeah i don't know if I that's mean, a great answer but it's a great question no i think it's definitely um no i mean i think it's something that is really it's much harder to um do in practice i would say than um something that one can script <laughs> um and i just from experience a lot of the students will sort of be talking about this kind of process of attunement but it's like you know it's like but yeah how do we actually do that in the same way that how do we if we attribute sort of greater agency to more than human entities how do we actually um how is that understood like how is the expressiveness of sort of materials actually um i mean certainly it's registering in different ways and it comes to our attention in different ways um but um i'm always i get i think it's the kind of uh, I, I guess it's this sort of experimental nature of creative practice where one can set up uh and produce certain kind of situations under specific kinds of conditions and um and then sort of um reflect on those materials um and that's uh i think much more different than someone within the context say, of say comparative literature who might be writing and reflecting on these things sort of critically and there's a certain kind of language that is utilized so um yeah it's something i'm always sort of grappling with in in as much as i make a claim for the agency of matter i uh, all of the technical kind of probes that i utilize in order to and somehow gain some sort of provisional access to those materials it's everything is coming is is ultimately a consequence of a very human centric kind of set of uh, decisions, perspectives, etc. Um, but I think it would be interesting to maybe for you to say a little bit more about uh, the experiments that you've been running. Um, and I guess my sense is that your listening sessions are through modes of playback rather than real time listening because you're dealing with microphones that are highly sensitive, um, have a sensitivity that's far in excess of, of the human ear. But can you say a little bit more about like, what you're actually doing? Are you embedding sensors in the soil? Um, that was my, or when I was listening to some of the recordings, maybe we can play one. Um, I felt I was hearing sort of more ambient sort of conditions of air and in, uh, atmosphere not necessarily little um, microorganisms that are sort of burrowing in the kind of soil. Um, maybe it'd be good to just get a kind of clear idea of, uh, clear sense of what you're, what you're doing when you, you're uh, creating this. You, you, you said um, one of your tasks is to reestablish relations with test earth, which I find really provocative. Yeah, I mean, uh, and I think there's a there's a general thing that I that I think about um, in terms of this kind of uh, relationship with the non-human, uh, with all of these kind of these agencies. And I think in the the first part is to uh, kind of know that they always there's always a relationship. You know, there's always some kind of interaction, um, but the nature of that interaction is much more um, difficult to translate into kind of uh, language for one, um, but even to just bring into like um, kind of consciousness, you know, just to like kind of make it apparent. Um, because it's such a, it's kind of like the, the 
it's the ground, you know, it's like the this kind of ambient and especially with the the kind of recording that I've been doing, um, the kind of infrasonic, the infrasonic doesn't register as sound, it registers as vibration and often as vibration like way below the threshold of, um, uh, yeah, like you just you can't even feel that vibration because it's happening at such a low um, frequency that it doesn't register as movement. You know? And so it becomes the movement, I mean, this is like some kind of poetic way to say something that's really true. It's like the movement that we register as stillness, you know? Um, and so there's that, I think that that is the kind of ground level of a lot of these kind of uh, our, our relationship to a lot of these bigger or wider agencies or not so apparent agencies is that they just become a kind of ground for us. Um, and so all of these, uh, I mean, back to the question of attunement, it's, it's more about translating, I think, things that are happening into another register. So kind of rendering them in this way, um, which kind of takes you a step away from the actual thing, but that's the, I think the, I'd say like the, the power and the kind of political um, resonance of translation is that it allows a relationship um, but through a kind of third party. So there is a kind of intermediate uh, agent. Um, and so for, uh, for this, for these recordings, um, I just I, like, I rebuilt this um, microphone that's used for, it's designed by this guy, uh, let's get his name right. Um, Jeff, oh, no, he's here. It's, his name is, um, I must get his name right. Um, Jeff Johnson. Uh, and he, he kind of took an existing McChesney professional microphone and redesigned it out of uh, cheaper parts um, for use by volcanologists uh, to do like seismic readings. Um, so it's the same stuff. It's just a kind of condenser button, um, but it registers really low vibration. So infrasonic, um, no, yeah, infrasonic um, vibrations, which are not um, audible. And so in order to hear them, so what you're hearing in the, in what we listen to are those sounds pitched up um, like between 200 or 800%. So it's like 200 times faster uh, and also like uh, amplified. So they're actually not very loud. I think one of the recordings is just the raw um, recording. There's a, a little a split and you can't really hear anything. I mean, you can, you can hear some more, those would be like ambient sounds. So the sounds of microbes kind of uh, worms and bugs kind of scratching through the soil, that's at a different um, kind of sonic register. And what, what we're actually listening to are on one hand, just general vibrations that are happening, um, the vibrations of like uh, the kind of earth just um, being yeah, propagated through the soil. Uh, and then any events that happen, so like, and then th that's kind of what these sensor rays are looking for in general. Like you have the kind of general signal, which you, you, you close as much as possible, you narrow it down as much as possible. So you know what the ambient sound is and then you listen for events, which would be seismic events or here, like maybe if a truck drives over a bump, something that creates a vibration at that frequency. So when we're listening, we're, we're at this, like exactly at that distance that you're talking about, where it's firstly been, a, it's like a selected bandwidth, um, frequency bandwidth, but then it's also been processed, it's been pitched up uh, in order to make it audible. Um, so we're in some ways like, 
uh, violating the, <laughs> the space of silence by pushing it up into, but it's, for me, I mean, it's something to listen, I mean, to think about for a long time um, still, um, but also to think about through listening, um, like how to kind of access or um, create this relationship with something that by its nature kind of occludes itself from this type of relationship. There's another type of relationship, which is that we kind of feel it, you know? Um, these are the vibrations that we understand as stillness or as silence. Um, but now we wanna have a relationship with this silence through hearing it. So there's some kind of like maybe poetic complication happening there. Um, but I think it's, it's, a, it's a mode you know, and it's, it's, and it's a mode that comes out of this technology. And I think there are, mm -hmm. there's so many other modes, but it's really this mode that emerges from the set of tools. Um, that was a very complicated answer. No, but it's really interesting because in some way it also, um, I feel it also sort of in some way grasps what's at stake on a, a a completely different scale, which and and what you're talking about, and in, in some ways, this relationship between signal and noise and the, the background strata. I mean, and um, a lot of acoustic uh, monitoring is precisely as you described. You're trying to look for the signals and the noise, and because the signal is an indication of an event, and the event is what matters, right? And um, and so we're constantly confronted with that, right? Where the sort of long durée of history, the slow incremental changes, what, say, Rob Nixon called slow violence, uh, we're always, you know, we really privileged the event, the kinetic dynamism of an event that erupts out of, seemingly out of nowhere, etc. So I think even on that level, we're already, to pay attention to that sort of, that sort of, vibrational sort of stratum of almost sort of like non-sound rather than privileging the kind of the moment that a track might create a different sort of vibrational sort of um, signal I think is really important because it reorganizes the field so the background becomes uh, important rather than in the kind of foreground and um, I'm mindful of a lot of the work that we've done in the center and also with forensic architecture where we really had to investigate the kind of minor details that we find in the background of images because the information that we're interested in doesn't actually exist and you have to develop other means of trying to access that. Um, so an image even, which is a field of visual information, there might be a subject in the center of the image that was, uh, and the picture was taken because that person or that scene was supposed to be kind of important. But, you know, in the margins of the image, there might be sort of a, a blurry kind of area where you actually might see, say, a destruction of a Palestinian sort of village, but they're actually cutting a ribbon in the foreground of the image, founding the state of Israel. And so that that kind of like inversion where background and noise are the things that are actually uh, important, uh, I think is a really significant kind of conceptual shift. And uh, environmental justice campaigns have always been really challenged by the fact that environmental uh, things that happen in environmental systems can have high degrees of latency especially when we're talking about things like contaminants moving through uh, groundwater, soil, uh, stuff like that. So um, I think, you know, what you've described really, I think, maps onto a whole set of other conditions which are, uh, you know, which in which this relationship between signal and noise, background, foreground is sort of operating and um, and the, the challenge is in some way to, is to, uh, is, is in some way to sort of like stay with the background, stay with the noise, rather than kind of like 
that which is already seen as being the kind of and that and troubling that troubling that which has been determined to be significant, right? Yeah, that's such a yeah. I mean, it's yeah. I think that's it. I love that phrase to stay stay with the noise. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's also such a a great way to describe um, the work happening in this um, research architecture, um, the center. Um, something I'm definitely going to think about for some time. Um, because I, I guess that's a general relationship, you know, and there's a maybe a kind of there's something more in the in that general relationship uh, or the implications of that general relationship. Of, yeah. Well, and also when we think about structural racism, infrastructural violence, right? These kind of like, you know, I think I mean all of the things that you're very aware of, right? How the, um, you know, just the kind of like, like the everyday kind of, the oppre oppressive nature of everyday life under certain kind of conditions and regimes, right? Um, that may erupt in a moment of kind of intensified violence, which is worthy of sort of, of journalism but it's really the kind of daily lived experience of bodies in sort of carceral states, right? And that kind of like, that grinding uh, everyday kind of like um, racism, violence, this, this sort of, you know, that just aggregates uh, in a very different kind of way. Um, I, I think there's also something about the everyday, um, and this is, yeah, this is something I'm thinking about quite a lot. Um, but there's something about dealing with things through the everyday, which also, um, like, I mean, the everyday is a kind of site of violence and it's the, the kind of aggregation of violence, but it's not reducible to violence, you know? Um, and so that kind of, uh, amalgam of what's happening in the everyday. And I think your description of what the, the center does is for me such a great example of that because in that everydayness you can like, um, you can extract like certain things, you know, like in the moment of celebration, you know, of whatever the, in the background or on the side or just as a kind of constituent part of that is the violence and um, vice versa, you know, in the violence, there is always this other th thing happening. Um, and that kind of complexity, I think, is this, this really difficult, um, uh, yeah, like conceptual mode to operate in. You know? um, and, and there's something there um, that I'm really, th that feels really rich for me um, in the sense that there's this possibility. And I think, I mean, historically, we're aware of this as um, like things emerge always out of these really complex environments. Um, and yeah, I mean, I don't really know how where to take it, but I think it's about this kind of irreducibility of um, what we might call noise. You know, you can kind of extract from it, but you can't really um, collapse it into a single uh, thing, a single um, yeah kind of reading. Um, yeah. No, I really, I think that I really like the way you've articulated that because it's like. Yeah, where it's like violence is a constituent part of the scene, but it's not reducible to that. There's a, there's something I think, yeah, really helpful in the way that you've conceptualized those relationships. Um, and I wonder whether in vis-a-vis re -vis your, um, your project, how do you, 
in how how in some way is that operating because um uh, so the sort of, because there is the the kind of the leg the colonial legacies legacies of apartheid that's all in some way part of the sort of what the sort of uh, the black earth that you're engaging with um but nor is the soil and all of its sort of like complex properties reducible only to that. Um, but how do you actually then, um, in your practice as an artist and through these strategies of playback and listening, um, how do you sort of render some of that in uh, into perception? Is it like is it through uh, like what do you what what in sort of in generating the work then is it is something restaged at a, in a different at a different scale in a different register that so we might have some say partial or provisional access to say more the kind of political register i guess is what i'm trying to get at yeah which mm. is certainly there in the way that you talk about your work um yeah i mean i think the and there's a thing that's really important to me and it's it's not it's about a kind of it's about staging relationships um and part of those relationships are outside of the work um and so i mean, just to think about these recordings um and playing them back it's there's a is the kind of milieu in which they emerge um which is kind of concrete material specific um but they then shared in kind of this environment, you know, between you and I. And there's, there's a, I mean, I, I don't think, I think the politics is not, I think the, the politics needs to be always just kind of present, but not optimized for, you know, maybe this is the thing that I'm, I'm really trying to get my head through um, is what kinds of, um what kinds of relationships come out of this material when it's not optimized for a particular signal you know? and the politics is always there and i think uh, it, it, it's related i think to a, an experience um and a, an understanding of certain modes of survival um, and the ways in which these highly politicized um yeah, kind of like event, um, <laughs> this kind of like event architecture of um, the oppressive environments in which we all kind of move through um, over determines something about their politics. And there's a, there's a politics that happens outside of that event structure. And, and that's the thing that I'm kind of aiming for um and I, and I think in my work like historically it's always been about a, presenting a certain excess uh so presenting a kind of like the fullness which can never be full of the kind of picture um uh to in some ways like overwhelm the scene with uh information about the scene um and I think there's a transformation in my own thinking, uh, which maybe goes back to uh, the of representation and um, uh, or just presentation, you know, like translation. And I think this transformation in my in my practice um, is about not. Um, extracting the information and presenting the kind of multiple signals but really sitting in the noise and presenting what we've been talking about as noise um and and i think in there in this case then it becomes about the the kind of relationships so listening relationships uh how you uh yeah share present and kind of stage um these listening relationships, not in order to give people access to the signal, but to to allow that, like um, the broadness of the noise, to really sit 
you know, to kind of have a presence. Um, it's, I don't think I'm um, like, it's a completely unresolved question, um, but it's very, I, I think the intentions are becoming clearer to me. Um, but I, I, it probably has to do with also um, some sense of specificity, you know, like a specific, specific site. Um, and did you get that? I think we cut out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and that's maybe the part um, that uh, kind of animates the noise, you know, the kind of specificity um, of its like emergence, let's say. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I can really um, relate to that because uh, I've in the past in particular um, when I was working on a series of documentary films in relationship to the after aftermath of um, ethnic conflict in Sri Lanka and in Kosovo and um, I just remember this incredible um, these experiences of going to these sites of say historic violence violence that was said to have been over you know like the war ended or the civil war ended and to find myself in these spaces where extreme events had taken place but in the contemporary moment there is little of like little visual evidence of as to you know what had transpired in these kind of places but in some way having this sort of conviction of that there was something to to see to hear to be aware of by spending time in this sort of site that um was and i would have to somehow be open to just that sort of unfolding experience but it was really a sense of conviction in that belief that there was a, and um uh I, I remember this sort of beautiful quote by Walter Benjamin about developing, if I remember it correctly, some sort of like stereoscopic vision that, to sort of see into the shadows of history, you know, um, even though I wasn't, I suppose, making a film, I was sort of trying to think through a kind of visual and to a you know a similar degree in a kind of acoustic register but it was really about a conviction that sort of spending time being attentive would somehow um enable this sort of almost a condition of telepathy or some something would kind of register but it wouldn't register in a way that would necessarily be kind of like perceptible in a kind of very explicit way. Um, but yeah, just this sort of sensibility of, uh, of being in locations where there is an awareness of what has gone on there, but yet it somehow, um, and then as a filmmaker, as an artist, trying to sort of develop strategies for in some way mediating those temporal relationships as well, right? Yeah. Yeah, and I think the is is something about um, like being in a place, going to a place, and being in place, um, and then leaving. You know, there's this kind of distance, uh, and maybe this is somehow connecting to uh, this question of like record, recording and playback, and what happens, what the kind of um, what it, this distance that's traveled or even the kind of processing distance that's traveled between the um, kind of recording of this data, the recording of this, um, uh, yeah, these signals, these kind of um, environmental um, energies, and then the playback. You know? and, and this distance is something uh, I don't, I still don't know how to think about it, um, or at least I'm not, I'm not yet comfortable uh, with the language to talk about it, but I think in that distance there's a kind of necessary uh, translation and transformation, um, which is also a kind of meaningful sight, 
you know, this, this, um, it's not, it's not like um, taking the, the space, it's not taking the place and representing the place, but it's about some kind of transformation of some quality of that place, um, which allows you to then have a relationship with that place differently, you know, or that moment differently. Um, and that, yeah, those steps in between, uh, those distances traveled, the intervening um, kind of agents, machine agencies and memories and whatever they are that kind of stand between there uh, is this, like, I mean, I've been thinking about them as kind of modeling protocols or like, kind of model agency there's something in that that's transforming and shifting and and then at the end you have something that can um represent this original space differently you know it's not at all and i think in the sensing apparatus is, there's a clear sense that there's not at all a one-to-one -one relationship to, between the data and the event um, but it's in how that apparatus is kind of configured that that relationship is made meaningful or not. Um, and that's something I've been, been thinking about. Um, mm -hmm. But maybe we should listen to some, some sense data. Um, some, I've been calling, the, calling it uh, like low, low silence low silence recordings um, and I think yeah I mean if we're lucky it's all in there <laughs> 